to your um, your current products as well. We will work with you with each district individually as to when we remove those applications uh, from your login directory. So uh, again, note that you'll have multiple applications uh, available to you while you're kind of in the transition and getting up to speed with the new products. <clears throat> okay, as Julie mentioned, we're gonna start with Explore, but I'm gonna go ahead and um, go through a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation. And we're just gonna kind of take a look at the uh, agenda for this afternoon. Uh, we're gonna try and uh, get things wrapped up here by uh, 3 p.m. Central time. So uh, hopefully uh, everyone has time to stick around, uh, but this will let you know uh, kind of a, a general view of uh, what we'll be talking about in what order. So I wanted to go through today and first again, remind everybody what's included in Guide K-12. Um, some of you may have joined our uh, upgrade preview webinar that we had a few months back. Again, this is meant to go over all of that as well as go into details about how to use the new functionality and to point out some more of the details in each of the product upgrades. So as usual, you have access to um, your standard three products in, in addition to the new one. So you have School Search, Explore, which is replacing Student View, Planner replaces Enrollment View, and Advisor is the completely new product, which is uh, very helpful for uh, analyzing data and, and trend data and taking a look at that in forms of bar charts, line charts, pie charts, and thematic maps. And we'll take a look at that in detail later on. So for the training, we're gonna go through Explore, then we'll take a look at the new product advisor, and then we'll jump over to Planner and show how each product has been upgraded and how to go about using them. What's new in Explore? Uh, if you haven't taken a look at it already, uh, again, as Julie mentioned, feel free to log in to your instance. Uh, you should have them available to you um, to be able to take a look at. And so you can log in yourself while I'm going through the training presentation. Basically, we have a bunch of new stuff in Explore. We have a bigger map, better visual appeal overall from the old map. The map tools have been moved onto the map and are more intuitive. No longer do you have to hit a query without selection button. We've simplified the query process immensely. While it was fairly easy once you learned how to do that before, it's even easier now. Uh, overlays, we've added standard uh, overlays to your um, menu for visualizing uh, boundaries on top of uh, current boundaries. So for instance, we now have outlines available in overlays for your all of your levels that have been added so that you can put them on top of the primary um, attendance zones that are being displayed. So you'll see your colored polygons of your attendance zones that are current, and then you'll be able to put outlines on top to visualize feeder patterns and such. We also now have extended capabilities for new data streams. So previously, you just had access to your student data as well as some basic parcel information, but that parcel information couldn't be filtered on by attributes or anything like that. It wasn't that intelligent. Now with our new data stream capability, not only do you have access to your default data streams of students and parcels, but those all data streams are configured separately to have all the attributes that you want to be able to be filterable, configured to be able to filter those data streams very quickly and very easily. So while students remains a, a big focus, we can now have you provide us with other data streams that we can load inside of Guide K-12. For instance, um, some customers like to add staff data streams or uh, maybe they have birth data streams about uh, birth data they've been collecting from uh, local county authorities or state departments of health. As long as data has an address, we can map that and create a data stream for it. Voter data streams are also another popular one, as you can see in the next bullet point. We have some uh, display uh, point display option changes that help you pick out multifamily dwellings much easier, and we'll show you those as we go through the Explorer changes. We also have included some new base maps, which include the satellite and hybrid views that you get from Google Maps. 
The summary window has some more flexibility and options built into it as well. We'll take a look at that. And we have better exporting and output options, in particular with the, um, with the map export itself being a much higher resolution and you getting an export of what you see on the screen. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and switch screens over to Explore. So if you haven't already and you want to, please open your Explore application and follow along. We're going to take a look at the uh, new user interface here for Explore and kind of walk through the changes and upgrades to Explore. I'll go ahead and start here right at the top. Uh, as you can see, we have a view dropdown. In this view dropdown is where you will have access to your data streams that are available to you. You can see here in our demonstration database, we have a student data stream, parcels data stream, and a births data stream. Again, each one of those data streams is configured individually and are able to be filtered on individual characteristics associated to that data stream itself. We are uh, currently viewing the student data stream and that's where we're gonna spend most of our time. Um, we'll take a brief look at parcels later since everybody has that as a default, but uh, we'll take a look now at the student data stream here uh, in our demonstration data set and kind of just work our way around the product. So again, you'll notice a very similar uh, look and feel to uh, student view, the previous product, um, where we've tried to maintain similar tools in the same location so that the learning curve is much less. One of the major changes is that we have, again, moved the map tools from this left-hand panel onto the map itself. This lets you know that those tools on top of the map are associated to map functionality. Um, we'll, we'll take a look at the left-hand panel first and we'll look at the map functionality later on. At the top of the left-hand panel is our filters area. We can see here we have uh, quick visibility into seeing what we are visualizing right now, where it says we've matched 38,387 of 38,387 total students. So we're showing all students in the demonstration data set. And we have the ability to, again, configure those attribute filters. We'll take a look at that in detail. I'm just going to uh, go through the left, rest of the left-hand panel before we come around to actually getting into the, the functionality. The summary dashboard is on the left-hand panel and again is specific uh, for each district to provide us with which attributes you want to be inside of your summary statistics. One of the main changes that we've made in Explore is to add in the percent of the selection along with the exact count. Previously in student view, you didn't have access to the percent of that selection. So uh, in going towards more intuitive results and being able to really understand what your selection contains, we've now added those percent counts. Again, these are the common attributes that we have uh, in our demonstration databases in our summary panel. Again, you can let us know per district, as a district, what elements you want to see in your summary dashboard. We do recommend that you keep that somewhat limited to you know, three, four, maybe five attributes at most so that that panel doesn't start to get too long and have to be scrolled all the time. Another reason for that is we've added much better enhancement to the map by section. In the map by section before in student view, you could map by all of your attributes, which we still can do today. But with today's map by section, we now have the counts and the percent again of that selection included in the map by section so that besides the summary panel dashboard items that you have um, attributes that you have configured you can get at the counts for any attribute that's listed in the map by section if i wanted to see it by grade and see a count breakdown by grade i would just switch my map by drop down to that attribute and the counts and percent update as well as the map uh, dots and what they are representing on the screen. So again, between your summary area and the map by, you now have uh, at full access to getting counts and percentages for all configured attribute filters in your data stream.
Okay, so that's our left-hand panel. Uh, there also is an export uh, button at the bottom, and we'll go over those options again when we start looking at the functionality uh, later on in the Explorer demonstration. Let's go ahead and take a look at what has changed in the map itself. I mentioned to you that we have new visualizations on the point rendering. I'm going to zoom down in. And as we zoom in, what you're going to see here now is that we have some clusters of points. And they kind of look like a honeycomb pattern or a diamond shape. Those are multifamily dwellings or dwellings with more than one student at them. We call them a scaled pack point. I'm going to open up my overlays dialog and show you that that is accessible from the filter overlays section at the bottom we now are able to very quickly toggle on the dots or bring them back on again as needed. And we have some different visualization options. Our default and re recommended is called the scaled packed points. Again, what that will do is that will take all students at a single address that are mapped to a single address and it will stack them around in this honeycomb pattern so that you can still visualize all the students at a single address at the same time. And the scale portion comes from the fact that it will adjust the dots accordingly as you zoom in and out. You'll notice now on the left-hand side where I'm zoomed to in the map by section, it says one dot equals one student. So we're at a one-to-one -one relationship. But as I zoom out, because of those pack point structure and multifamily dwellings, the further I zoom out, the harder it may be to discern all those dots in an area, and it just may look like a big mess on the screen. So it will scale itself, and as we zoom out, you can still see we're at one-to-one, -one, but as we zoom out far enough, our scaling will eventually change, and you can now see one dot is equal to uh, less than or equal to 1.87 students. So it's going to aggregate students within a certain air radius with the similar attribute that we're mapping by so that you can still visually make out what's on the map. I'm gonna zoom back down into a tighter area again here. And we're gonna take a look at the other visualization changes. So again, we now have four available. The scale pack point is our default and recommended but there's also packed points. What that will do is give us a one dot equals one student representation all the time. It will never scale itself as you zoom out. So for some districts, it may work well. For others, it may not. It's all dependent on how large of an area your district covers and how far you're zoomed out. So again, recommended to stay with the scaled pack point. We also have a stacked point option, which basically mim mimics what we used to have in student view. It is a single address location representation. So you lose the ability to easily identify multifamily dwellings, but you clean the map up if you're just looking at uh, wanting to see where, where your addresses with students are. So it can make a cleaner map if you're just looking to do that type of analysis or printout of where you just need to see the single address. We also have another new uh, visualization called a pie cluster. And I really like this for kind of a high level overview to, be, to see what might be happening in a particular area to, to explore it further. I'm going to change my map by to something that I might be more interested in looking at. Maybe I'm interested more in our free and reduced classifications in this area. The pie clusters allow you to see a pie chart based on the map by attribute and give you a quick overview in areas and count as you can see it's aggregating again students in similar like areas and putting a pie chart together to give you a visual of what the area makeup is based on the map by attribute if i wanted to further that further explore them say i was interested to go in and explore this pie area where there's 52 kids up here i could zoom in there and then my pies will start to get down to the individual household with numbers of students at 
those locations. So again, those Pi clusters will update and change as you zoom in and out of the map. I'm going to go back. Can I? Yes. yes, Julie. Can I ask a question? Um, you may. You, you, um, right now, the number of students that you're dealing with is kind of the whole population for this yes. particular district. Um, and, and you're showing the map by and you're changing the dots um, because map by changes the dots. Can you explain the difference between filtering and map by? Because I know that's coming, but I just want to kind of, you, we'll get to it later, but, but you've been making changes with map by, so I thought it might be a quick um, mention and then we can get into more of the details later. Absolutely. The map by uh, is simply taking um, the dots that we have on the map and it's representing them by their attribute that we are interested in visualizing those attributes by. It's going to apply to all dots on the screen and does not filter. So filtering is actually the case where we're, we're going to go and do next where we can actually filter the list down to a very specific sub subset of students or data stream elements since again this applies to all data streams. So let's take a look at that. Maybe we wanted to take a look at these, the map by free and reduced, and but we were really interested in looking at just our ELL students. So we could come into our configure attribute filters dialog, and you can see from the top left, we still have all students selected. I'm gonna go ahead and apply this. So this is laid out identically to uh, student view where we have the categories that you can filter on the left, the values will appear on the right as you click through each of the different categories. And you turn the checkboxes on for those that you want to filter on. At the bottom is a um, summary of what you're filtering on. And once we're done selecting values, we can click the finish button. And now we've filtered our students down to 2,657 students. Again, these are just students receiving ELL services. Again, maybe we wanted to also limit that to only elementary schools. We could come into the school type. School type, by the way, is a new attribute that we've created so that you have quick access to filter by levels. So rather than having to go into the elementary school level and click the all and check all, you can just go to school type, elementary school, finish that, and you'll be filtered down to the elementary school only students. So that's a quick difference between map by and filtering. The map by will apply the attribute colors or values to the dots on the map for the selected set or filtered set of students. And Dan, uh, the filters are mirrors or set up by each individual district. So for everybody that's looking at your instance, if there are things that are not broken down to the granularity that you can see in your SIS or you want to look at it differently, um, that's a call to Dan and his team and, and we can get that set up. So if you have 20 home languages that you want in there and it's not showing, let us know. But those attributes, if your attributes aren't matching what Dan is showing, it's, it's really because the those are individual and customized based on your individual district. So if you've got seven classifications for special ed students or um, you know, look at AP courses, you've got maybe 14 AP courses that you offer or those kinds of things, it will look different. And I just encourage you to really look at that and see if the data uh, is broken down to the granularity that your district needs to make the decisions it does. Yes, that's a great uh, thing to point out, Julie. Thank you. So you'll see many, many of you will have similar attributes here um, in the list here. And uh, again, it's where your values will likely um, be different, though, in cases, uh, again, depending on what level of granularity you're sending from your student information system. And those can be changed if they are needed to. We also encourage you to add new fields, uh, new attributes. Um, with your student data as again with the new product advisor coming in this really becomes a tool now that 
I believe will be able to be utilized much more frequently. As you'll see in Advisor, it is a very quick way to make uh, your, your graphics for presentations for uh, weekly meetings or monthly board meetings or whatever you may have a need to do when it comes to um, doing different charting options. Uh, you'll see it's much easier to use than having to pull that data into Excel and create pivot tables and pivot charts uh, and so forth. Okay, so we've kind of taken a look at filtering by attributes. Again, to this point, many things have stayed very, very similar. Um, again, we have improved or in much more streamlined filtering where you just don't have to hit query without selection any longer. I'm gonna go ahead and hit the clear all button. This will bring all of our students back. And one thing I pointed out too in uh, going over the changes to explore again was with the overlays, you'll see that we have now added again in the other category here, or I mean above the other, you'll see that we have our school boundaries. These are not where you toggle on or off the main colors. And let me make this easier to see by turning off the student dots. We still have you change your levels by going up to the school type drop down in the right hand corner. Set of radio buttons, it is now a drop down. You'll see my background color have changed to the middle school, but I still have outlines outlining my elementary school boundaries. So you can see in the school boundaries section of the overlays dialog, we now have three additional options, or in your case, it will be however many levels you have that allow us to toggle the outlines for different layers on and off. So I could have elementary, middle, and high school, and they're designed to be able to be overlaid on top of one another as well. So you can see those different feeder patterns. I have to say, Dan, this is one of my favorite features of being able to look at and anticipate needs for um, you know, next year, being able to look at very specific groups and specific programs. Maybe I wanna look at fifth graders in a specific program and see how they're um, performing or see, see uh, where they are located and then overlay the, the middle school boundaries or the high school boundaries and anticipate kind of the, uh, the resources and the capacity in, uh, by need, so that's one of my favorite features. Absolutely, and again, that was a, a highly requested thing that people would come and say, well, can we get some overlays so that we can visualize multiple levels uh, on top of each other? And so we just decided to add that into everybody's configuration. Um, so again, you should have those uh, overlays available to you. If not, certainly let us know. Um, I will point out right now, again, you are seeing your upgrades for the first time. We've kind of gone through and done some um, some testing, but if something's missing that we did not port over from your existing student view enrollment view configuration as far as overlays go, please send us an email and let us know about that. You can always email service at guideK12.com um, or your individual contacts you may have worked with in the past uh, and let us know if anything didn't get transferred over from student view enrollment view and we'll make sure that we get that done. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move on then. Um, in the rest of the overlays, the overlays dialog is a new one. You'll notice it replaces the map tab, which used to be on the left-hand side. So that has been moved. There's a button in the top right-hand corner of the map, and that can be, again, just toggled on and off. It does have a semi-transparency so that you can kind of leave it up uh, uh, if you want to, if you have a larger monitor, and then it doesn't interfere with the map the entire time, or you can just keep closing it and opening it as needed. But as usual, with the same uh, layout as the map tab, you have your left-hand checkbox to turn on the, the features or the geometry itself, and the right-hand, if there are labels available, that is where you can turn on labels or off the turn them off if you don't need them. I will point out too, we have a zoom to district button. So you don't have to go up anymore to the drop down uh, and choose the, the zoom to full district. You can just click on the home icon on the right hand side here, and that will zoom you to your starting extent of your district boundary. Okay, I'm gonna zoom back down. 
in here a little bit, and we're going to start taking a look at our map tools. Again, remember the map tools have been moved on to the map so that they're very specific uh, of which tools belong to map functionality. Starting on the left-hand side here, well, I should go back. I should point out all of the ways you work with the map from zooming and panning, as far as moving the map around, have stayed the same. You still have the same options available. Um, we click, hold down, and drag and release to pan the map. And you still have all the options of double clicking to set, zoom in one level and recenter, using your scrolling wheel to zoom in and out. You also have the slider on the left hand side as well as plus and minus buttons. So all that functionality has stayed the same and is available in the new Explorer. What has changed a little bit is how we work with the map and how we work with the students. I'm going to go ahead and make sure I turn back my student dots on. I'm going to go ahead and set my map by back to school of attendance. And we're going to take a look at the map tools. The first one on the left is, is the default or the navigate tool. To be able to pan the map and zoom the map, zoom the map in most situations, you will need to have this tool active. Active tools are denoted in green. Blue are inactive. So right now our navigate tool is active, meaning I can, I can zoom in, I can pan on the map, and I can also now readily identify students on the map by just clicking on them. So before where you used to have to check a radio button to identify now in Explore, you can simply go to the center of a cluster of dots or packed points, click on them and get a preview window of the students at that location. Again, it uses a kind of a tolerance. So depending on how close you are zoomed in or how far you're out, you may get more students or less than you were expecting. So if you're looking for, a, in this case, I clicked on a pretty specific area of five students and we see I got five records returned here. Now from that, rather than working with the filtered set, I can just work with these individual students if I wanted to dump them to Excel or a CSV or do mailing labels. We still have that mailing label functionality with the three Avery uh, label styles, the ability to choose who to address those labels to, and then to download those labels. So all of that now can be done at the individual student level, not just the filtered selection. Next to the Navigate tool, we have our drawing tools. We still have our three ge geometry types we can draw. So we can draw points, polygons, and lines. Our default is to draw polygons. Remember, points and lines will need buffer distances, and we'll get to those tools in just a moment. But we're gonna take a look at the Draw Polygon tool and take a look at the changes that have been incorporated into Explore with the drawing tools. They're much easier to work with from the standpoint of making edits to those areas. So I'm gonna go ahead and define a polygon. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn my overlays on here. As I usually suggest, it's always a good idea to have your parcels up to be able to draw right to the parcel. So I'm gonna box in a neighborhood. And so it's the same way as it used to be with student view. You start by doing a left click and release to draw and have to have at least three points drawn to have a polygon. To finish, you can either double click at the last point prior to the point of beginning. So I could double click right here, it would close it. I'll show you the other option now available, which is to go back to the point of beginning. You'll see that that blue cursor snaps to the point of beginning and I can do a single click at the point of beginning. That will also close it. So a double click at the point before point of beginning or a single click once you snap to the point of beginning will enclose that polygon. And now you can see we've selected 
those students in that area. We're down to, we can see here from the summary dashboard, we have 46 filtered students. One thing that you could not do easily before was edit these shapes. Again, if, if you needed to edit that shape, you had to click the radio button and go back and forth. Now you can see that there's intelligent snapping when it comes to the drawing tools. As I get near this polygon, it's going to snap that blue dot to the line or to the vertex points that already exist. From there, I can grab these points and move them and my selection will automatically update on the fly. So editing is much easier. I can also, you'll notice this, I can zoom and pan with all of my tools. I can pan just by clicking and dragging while I'm in my drawing tool mode. And so I'm now able to get very close, zoom in and do editing much quicker and much more granular than we used to be able to with student view. And again, as we make those changes, it's dynamic. It's always updating the selection area with the new area you've drawn. Another major change is the fact that you can now draw multiple shapes on the screen, not just one. If you recall in student view, when you would draw a polygon and then draw the next one, it would erase the old polygon and draw just the, show just the new one. Now we can do multi-area selections that are non-contiguous that you might have a need to select. So I'll draw another polygon. In fact, I'll draw three polygons to show you some of the other new tools that we also have avail available. Looking to the right of the draw tools, you'll notice we have a eraser pencil tip as well as a garbage can. These allow you to either delete individual features you've drawn or delete all of them at once. I'm gonna go ahead and click on the pencil tip eraser. And you'll notice now if I hover over one of my features, it's going to highlight in blue. If there's a polygon I didn't mean to select or I wanna get rid of, once it's highlighted in blue, I click on that and it will remove that polygon. To the right of the eraser tools, you'll notice we have undo and redo tools. If we didn't mean to do something, if something was done on accident, we deleted something or, or whatever, we could hit the undo button. And again, there's a redo. So there, these undo and redo tools, again, are specific to map functionality. They will not affect uh, undoing or redoing filters, but they will be able to um, just undo what you did on the map. I see a question about if I have the area selected in polygons, can I see the specific data? Absolutely. So now that we have two polygons selected here, you can see our breakdown 158 students. I now can go down to the export button and we have a current selection option. That'll bring up a familiar preview dialog. This is previewing, again, this is just previewing the selection of 158 students. From here, you can export to Excel, CSV, shapefile, which is a GIS or mapping format, or again, mailing labels. Uh, please note, this is a preview, and what your district has set up is just a preview of attributes, so it may contain all, it may not contain all of them. Again, you can choose to tell us if you want more or less attributes in the preview window. Um, but when you do an Excel output, I'm gonna go ahead and output this. You'll notice we get our confidential data notice um, because there may be PII in these extracts. You can have that message turned off if you don't wanna see that again. I'm gonna put this into Excel format. And because I have I won't be able to show that right now um, as I'm sharing just one screen, but uh, essentially in Excel, you're going to get all attributes back that you provide in your nightly uh, SIS extract to us 
um, not just what's in the preview. So you will see all attributes. And that's another one where if you don't, certainly let us know and we'll make sure that all of the attributes are in your extract as they are supposed to be. All right, so that's how we uh, are able to select multiple areas now with polygons and to export or view those individual students that were selected. I'm going to go ahead and hit my, uh, well, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to hit the delete, delete can, delete all, get rid of all of the drawings and get back all of the students. I'm also going to turn my parcel back off. Please note your parcels will turn themselves off again as they used to in student view and enrollment view when you zoom too far out that they would be just a big globby, uh, glob of mess, they will turn themselves off. So it's up to you whether you want to toggle your parcel layer on and off, but I'm just going to go ahead and turn it off to make this a little bit clearer. And we're going to take a look at our advanced tools. So if you remember the advanced tools inside of uh, student view and enrollment view, we have those same tools available. By clicking on our new icon here, you'll see that we now enable the advanced tools dialog. Once this is up, we have check boxes for the different options. You notice we still have the layer option. We can choose any of our layers inside of Guide K-12 from the overlays dialog to use as selection areas, as well as buffer distance. We can buffer any of the shapes we draw. And now we have an option to invert the selection. So let's take a look at an example of using two of the tools. I'll go ahead and start with the layer option. Let's say we want to select area, uh, students by attendance area. I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit further here so we can select aggregates here. Again, previously when you, in student view, you could you could click one area at a time with the point tool. Now with the draw point tool, I can click in as many areas as I want to. I'm gonna point out to something uh, about this tool and about the way this is currently set up. You'll notice that I clicked one point inside of Jostin Elementary's Northwestern boundary, but it selected another area. That is because Jostin has discontinuous areas in their attendance zone. They have a split attendance zone. So the product was smart enough to know that it had multiple areas for that school and it selected both. Uh, in the future, we, do, we are looking to add an option that would allow you to choose whether you wanted it to choose single parts of the attendance area or by default if you wanted it to have it select all of them. So you'll, in the future, again, a future enhancement will have a little more granularity than, than even this. This is the default, again, just because we want to make sure that if there are discontinuous areas, people know that if they want to select by an attendance area, it's going to grab all of that attendance area. I also now can, can continue to click points, and it will aggregate. No longer does it get rid of the previous selection and create a new one. I am now aggregating this additional area with the first area that I selected. Once this is Dan, drawn, you can also edit the points. And I suspect, Julie, is that where, where you were going to go next? Yep. So what Julie was going to get into is another exciting part where, again, while you're in edit mode, you can simply drag your point to a new polygon, release it, and it will move the selection to that area. So again, editing is much easier. You can take those points and drag and drop them. And again, you can continue to work with your delete one tool up here to delete specific ones to manage those areas selected much better. It's, Once it's this very is subtle. Done, oh, it's very subtle on our screens. But when Dan selected the boundaries that were up in the blue, the Justin Elementary, the split boundary, there was a magenta dot that he dragged. Among all those other dots, there's a bigger dot that's kind of purple. Yeah. And, and by grabbing that magenta dot and dragging it into the next boundary area, it snapped to the new boundary areas. Um, so, so I just want to point out that that one feature yeah. as uh, yeah. if you want to. So, 
drag it, you drag the purple. Yep, it's the, and again, you'll always see it snap to the feature by getting close with your blue cursor, blue dot cursor, it'll snap and have a white outline. Then you know it's snapped to that feature. So the next new tool I wanted to talk about here was, well, what if you want to find everybody that's outside of a particular area? You couldn't do that previously very easily. So now we have added an invert selection option in the advanced tools. If I click invert selection, it's going to go ahead and now give me everybody that's outside of those selected polygons. This is something that I really think communication directors can benefit from because if there's a isolated incident in the in the district with an oil, you know, an, a water main break, um, police activity, something going on in the district where you want to notify families within a certain radius or um, within a boundary, or you want to draw a polygon and select the area, you could do any of that or select a two mile radius from any point. But being able to say, you know, the families within this three mile radius need to know um, this information and everybody outside of that area um, needs a different message. And that's easy to do um, through outputting that to an auto dialer. Yes, and another great use of the invert selection is in the transportation realm where you may have walk areas that are defined that you know the students within a walk area, but you may want to also see who's not in the walk area. And then there's um, the ability to quickly invert that selection there based on your walk areas that you may have loaded. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn the advanced tools off. One thing to note. You'll notice that as long as I have a checkbox on here, we want to make sure that you don't um, have have the chance to have a mistake in, in your selection by closing the advanced options dialog while it's actively being used. So you'll notice I cannot close that dialog by clicking on the advanced options toolbox again, because again, there's a option being used. What we had happen previously with the old product was it was that tool was expandable and collapsible and there were people would collapse it and sometimes they wouldn't realize that the advanced tools were still set and they were wondering why their selections or drawings weren't working as expected. So you'll notice here, I'll uncheck all of my boxes. Now I can close the advanced options toolbox. All right, I have some points still drawn on the map. So let's just show the buffer option. I should have done that while I was here. I'm gonna uncheck the layer and I'm just gonna find everybody within a two mile radius of those points I drew. So again, now we have multiple options where we can, I'm gonna drop this down to a half a mile. and draw a bunch more points here. You can see there's no limitation now to the number of points that I draw and create buffers for. And it will go ahead and aggregate these into account and we should get them to render here shortly. It's a little slow sometimes on the go-to meeting. There they are. So we can have multiple points on a map. It would be the same thing as if you had if you use the layer option with a point layer, you would be able to, again, just like in student view, select or draw a big polygon around all the points you wanted to have selection sets made from, and you'd be able to use those points as well. The buffer distance tool, again, also works with our draw line tool. So I've deleted all of our points, and now I'm just going to go ahead and draw a line again. Maybe we wanted to identify uh, an area and a half mile swath of a, of a road that maybe had a water break or uh, is a road closure going on and we want to notify people uh, within a local area, not the entire district. We can use that draw line tool and again we can come in here and edit that line again very easily with our tool just by snapping to that line that we drew and moving it where we need to move it.
All right. So those are the all the new drawing tools. Uh, some new, some old again, but with new increased functionality. I'm going to go ahead and zoom to full district again. We're spending a lot of time in Explore. Explore does have um, all the majority of the uh, uh, enhancements, the functionality, and really is the basis for the other products map functionality. So we really learn about the functionality and what's new in Explorer, and then it will apply to the geography tools. We can use at Advisor, the new product, as well as Planner, the boundary planning um, software piece. So we've got just a few more minutes here that we'll take a look at some pieces uh, inside of Explore, and then we'll be moving on shortly in case you're wondering when we're going to get to the other modules. I thank you for your patience as we go through all of the changes in Explore first. So in the upper right-hand corner, where we used to have our radio buttons for changing levels or your school type again, you'll notice again we've got a drop-down to change our school type, but we've also added base map options. So we have a basic road, which is what we're viewing, which is a basic Google roadmap. We also have the satellite map. I'll go ahead and turn those student dots off so we can see this a little bit better. So now you can see we've got aerial photography, as well as the hybrid version of that, which will have the roads on top of that. And if you're in an area and you care about terrain, you can take a look at the terrain map in Minnesota here where our demonstration data set is, there's not a lot of terrain, so you won't see steep hills and things like that and mountains. But if, again, if that's of interest, that is a layer available or a base map available for your mapping options. We also have added some travel layers from the Google Maps travel layers. Maybe you're interested in taking a look at your safe routes to school. So we have a the bicycling or bike trail layer. You'll see those come up on the map. Again, it's using Google layer data. We also have local uh, mass transit that is available to be seen. So it would show bus stops, et cetera, here uh, in areas where there is mass transit. And that's Google. Again, these are all Google travel layers. And a live traffic feed. So if you wanted to see if there were issues with transportation routes, uh, you could turn the live traffic layer on inside of Guide K-12. On the top here, again, we took a look at the different view options for the data streams, but to the right of that, we have our search bar. So the search bar is no longer on the left-hand side on its own search tab, but there is a search bar at the top. We can enter student names, addresses, um, or school buildings here. And you'll notice I'm going to go ahead and type in the name. I'll just type in a name here, and you'll see I started to do Davidson Elementary. If you want to zoom to an extent of a attendance zone, you can find that school, or just to zoom to a school even if it doesn't have an attendance zone. And you click on the Show button. It will zoom either to the attendance area or to the school. You'll notice it also when I started searching, it searched across our data streams. I'm going to go ahead and just pick out an address here that I see now, and I'll, I'll go ahead and enter that, 8457 Emory Parkway. And what you'll notice here, now I'm finding records that are associated to that address across all data streams that are loaded in our demonstration database. So we can see that at 8457 Emory Parkway, we have two students. Here is the parcel owner for that address. And there was a birth address that was found at that location. So the search is very powerful in that it does search across data streams. A lot of our customers like to use that for residency checks potentially to see if the uh, student uh, actually lives there at that parcel uh, and is associated to the owner. And again, to zoom to those features, you just click the show button and it will zoom to that location.
the search will stay as long as you have your text type in there, that search will continue to stay in there until you remove that from the, from the drop down area. Over to the right, we have a, our Guide K12 icon and a three bar settings menu. From here, you can see we have some different links, um, standard terms and conditions and privacy policy uh, of our service, if you're interested in those, as well as a couple that you may actually find interesting to use it from time to time. Well, let me talk about the Clear My Settings first. Clear My Settings will go ahead and take all of the things that have been remembered in cache or in cookies, such as your map zoom extent, what your attribute filters currently are set to, what your spatial filters are set. So if you have drawings on the screen, all of that is remembered so that if you were to quit and come back, as long as the settings don't get cleared, it's going to come back to exactly where you left off. So even if you log out and come back in, as long as you're on that machine and you log back in, it's going to come back to where you left off, including filter settings, the zoom extents of the map, as well as any drawing tools you may, or drawing uh, features you may have on the map. If we hit clear my settings, and I'll go ahead and do that, it's going to ask if you're really sure you want to do this, and it's going to basically reset Explore back to scratch. So you're going to get this, even if you've said, show this method unchecked to this option, it will bring up the end user license agreement again by clearing your settings. And you'll notice now everything has reset back to uh, default. The other option up here in the three bar settings that is of interest again, and, and many of you I'm sure have used this to look at your ungeocoded students is our vintage information. So vintage information tells us how accurately and how well your student data or that data stream, for instance, are geocoded and mapped. So we can see here very clearly of what we're doing. We have some enhanced geocoding processes that you don't necessarily need to know about, but certainly we give you insight into how we are geocoding things and what they've mapped to and the level of mapping. And so we have different categories and we have rooftop and centerline matches, rooftop being very precise, center lines being interpolated along a street. And I think a question came in here, so I'm just gonna take a look. Well, as you look at that, I was just going to add, Dan, that um, for a lot of districts, because we are um, geocoding nightly from an automated feed from your SIS, this is a great tool to be using to check on the accuracy of the data in your SIS. And the reports that can pull out of here are very helpful for front office personnel or who's ever updating SIS records. Um, to be able to really look and figure out where they should be uh, doing some fine tuning or some scrubbing. So it really makes their job better. So we, um, I just highly recommend that, uh, that you kind of look at your geocode accuracy rate and, um, and then look at those um, that are not geocoding. And if it's students that maybe are, um, they're homeless or they're, um, something else is going on, letting us know that so those students can be geocoded maybe to the district office, so you can really get a sense of um, kind of which students have bad addresses in the system and um, and what's going on. So what, what basically we'll do is if we don't map a student, it's gonna map it at zero, zero latitude, longitude, which puts it out in the ocean. So if you ever do zoom to a student that isn't geocoded and you see this blue C, that's, that's probably a student that isn't geocoded. Um, and again, we do have, the, the question basically was asking if there is the ability for um, users to add geocodes in for things, maybe new developments or things that we don't have the data for yet that may not have geocoded because it's too new or, or even errors. No, we don't have that capability yet today. Um, that is certainly something that we're looking into. As always, you can provide us you know, certainly let us know what addresses are not hitting. You can provide the location if you want to with a latitude longitude coordinate, or we'll just research the address and find out where it's supposed to be, and we'll go ahead and place that record in. 
sometimes it's just a matter of going back out to the local authority of address information, such as the county or city, and getting an updated data set. Um, and we usually get that done again. As most of you know, we go out at least quarterly for those um, districts that have uh, counties that have easy access to data and can do it more frequently if needed. But for now, continue to send us those addresses um, and even if you know the locations, the coordinates for those locations, and we can get those manually uh, overridden so that when the update comes through, we'll know where to place those students until um, it gets into the reference source from the county that we collect. And I think I see another one, another question, Julie. Yeah, okay. So let, let's get to the, the question is around the vintage date and information. What you'll notice here in our demo database is not gonna reflect yours necessarily. The created date's going to be basically when your instance was created, your Explorer instance was created. And the last modified will be the date that um, the data was loaded last from a nightly uh, update uh, of your data. So it should be reflecting in your data, the last modified date should be yesterday we we did experience some issues with that being current or updated um, we are continuing to process all updates nightly but again in some cases we were seeing that that last modified date wasn't quite matching what it was supposed to so again um, we're we were we were working on that and i thought my last uh, i believe that that issue is resolved um, let me know otherwise and uh, we'll look into that one The last thing about vintage information that I want to show is we've added what is called the successful geocode count to the summary window. By checking that option on, if I'm ready to make a decision based on data that we've been viewing in Guide K-12, and there's a geographic component to that decision, I certainly want to know how well my geocode rate is based on the attribute that might be important. So say I'm making a decision based on um, the number of special ed kids living in a certain area or ELL. I'll want to turn on that successful geocode count and go over to my summary panel on the left hand side and now you'll see a red column has been added. That is the geocode count along with the percent of the geocode match rate. So you'll notice that if we go down to transfer status, which now has a classification of unknown location, now you don't have to just guess who's not mapped you are able to filter out students who aren't mapped by using the transfer status um, choice of unknown location. We can see that obviously there's 768 in our uh, data set here, uh, demo data set, and none of them geocoded. And so they're at a 0%. But again, this would allow you to take a look at again, maybe we wanna look at that. Well, we've got our special ed up here. We can see our special ed breakdown in percent. That way you make sure that you're making a decision based on sound data. So I like to point that out that that is an option now available to you to not just see the overall geocode rate, but you can see how well every classification or attribute is actually geocoded. Okay, so Julie, I kind of wrapped up the things that I wanted to show. Is there anything else that you wanted me to touch on Explorer before we move on? Nope, that's a really comprehensive view of Explorer. And again, Explorer, I think of as the sandbox and, and the place that you can get at all the student information and the individual student names and really do some in-depth analysis. And so really, it, it, it should be available to anybody on the cabinet. Um, Dan uh, probably mentioned right next to that guy K-12 logo. It's, um, it says explore, but if you click on that drop down, it gives you all the other modules and allows you to move between modules very easily. So, um, you know, so much of what Dan has already talked about, the tools and the principles um, all will apply now as we move into planner and planner again is some scenario planning. It's really designed if you're opening buildings, closing buildings, uh, moving a grade, uh, changing attendance boundaries in any way. Planner is really uh, customized for that functionality. And, uh, and there's a few nuances 
but the summary windows, the tools, a lot of what we've already covered all work the same and give you a very, very similar feel. There's just a few nuances um, and, uh, and Dan will cover those. Uh, but one of the biggest ones um, is that the uh, students that you're looking at uh, are specifically tied to just the, the um, school type. So if you're doing elementary boundary changes, you're only looking at elementary students. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Dan to, to kind of walk us through Planner. All right. We'll be doing Advisor. We'll take a look at Advisor first. Um, no, I'm going to go gonna back. Advisor. Yes. Before I go to Advisor, however, uh, I was going to just show real quick, again, because you all should have a parcel data stream loaded, we represent parcel data streams as centroids or the middle of a parcel. So again, here you're seeing a parcel data set represented as dots. So that selections are easy to do with the parcels. So all of these dots represent a parcel. And depending on which attributes were available from your local county authority, you may or may not have the same ones here, um, such as homestead, uh, dwelling type, and estimated market value. So depending on, again, what's available from your county, you may or may not have the same things. Having said that, if there are other tax roll information or parcel information that is important to your uh, data stream and you know it's available through your local county uh, assessor or, or mapping authority, you certainly can contact them about, um, you know, maybe it's just they didn't have those attributes available to us in a publicly accessible data set. And so we can again get additional attributes on your parcel data stream if you need additional detail. And again, just contact us and let us know that, and we'll uh, figure out the next steps to make sure we get that. Okay, I'm going to, I've got a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation on Advisor to get us set up. And while he's pulling that up, really Advisor, the way I explain Advisor, and I really, um, encourage everybody to think about Advisor as it's all in the power of Guide K-12, um, but you don't have to just be um, thinking about it from a mapping perspective. It's, it's really the power of Excel without the pivot table. So it allows you to create bar charts, pie charts, graphs, um, all with the simple drop down and selection that you um, use in, the, in our other modules, just being able to filter data, but having it instantly create charts and graphs but the thing that I love about advisor is I can uh, if I have a bar chart of maybe I have um, selected all of the fifth graders in special ed by toggling I can then map those students so I can move from a bar chart to a map or if I selected an area on the map I could bounce back and have that data selected drive the drawing of the charts or graphs so to me, it's an incredibly powerful tool. An advisor, as you get to know it, will probably be your go-to place for a lot of analysis because it, it doesn't have to be just geographic-based information. It, to me, uh, as I use advisor more and more, it's kind of my go-to for um, really my starting point for a lot of things. So uh, with that, Dan, it looks like you're ready to go with PowerPoint. I am, and, and whoop, I lost that here. All right. As Julie mentioned, uh, she talked about a couple of things about Advisor. Basically, you can do bar charts, line charts, pie charts, and thematic maps. And we'll discuss thematic mapping um, when we get in there, as that may be new to many of you. Uh, you can also do longitudinal reports easily. Uh, we'll talk more about uh, snapshots, historical, current, and annual snapshots of student data that can be loaded. Also, once we get into Planner, we'll show you how Advisor and Planner actually talk to each other and can be used for advanced reporting and analysis of your boundary planning scenarios. Again, thematic mapping, we'll take, take a look at what that is and how it works and outputs from Advisor. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and clear my settings here and, and come in fresh to what you would see in the advisor. 
you're going into Advisor for the first time, you're basically going to come into a new bar chart, which is going to be empty. Let's take a look at the different elements of Advisor. At the top, just like we had our view option in Explore, our focus option allows us to choose which data stream we're going to be using. Again, all of your data streams that are configured in Explore are able to be used in Advisor as well. Below that, we have our analysis section. The top four icons allow us to switch between the different document types, as we call them. From left to right, we have bar chart, line chart, pie chart, and thematic maps. Below that, we have some different options, and we'll talk about these more in detail, but we have some options for saving a link to a document or cloning that to a new tab. When there is an analysis, we have some export options available with the result and a button that will start a brand new document. So basically, again, you come into a blank bar chart and you'll notice that we have a title and a subtitle. The subtitle will auto-populate based on your selection of your series and, and groups um, on the left-hand side. You can always choose to double-click to edit this title and subtitle. But again, I recommend leaving that subtitle in particular as it's going to specifically tell you if you have filters set and what you're visualizing. To get a basic chart drawn, we can do something very simple. We really only need to do one mouse click to get attendance numbers, for example. So if we want to take a look at this, or I should say a couple of mouse clicks, right now by default, you can see we have our vintage as current. If I just want to take a look at my special ed population, we just click on the series dropdown and choose our attribute we want to look at. And we're showing all students. And you can see our title is special ed, and it's the count of special ed. So all these drop downs are easily changed to get quick representations of the number of students. Dan, if I wanted to see percentage, how do I do that? So those are in the output options below. So when we do have a chart created, we have a couple of different output options. And those output options will change depending on what you're visualizing and looking at. So for instance, if you're just looking at a single vintage, such as we are right now with the current vintage, we get two options. We can look at the student count, which we are currently getting. So the numbers on the chart on the right sides of the bars indicate the number of students. Or we can take a look at the group share percentage. So that changes to a percent. So those two options are available on the single vintage option. Let's take a look at vintage options. If we just want to visualize or make a chart for one vintage at a time, You'll notice if I click on the drop down, you may or may not you may or may not have all of these available. You'll notice in our demo set, and I'm not sure any of our customers yet have school years. This is something you would need to provide us. But essentially, school years can be annual snapshots that you designate as a school year snapshot that you may want to use for analysis and comparison. We also have our monthly vintages, which list current as well as any of your normal monthly snapshots that we take for you. Please note those snapshots at this point will only exist in Explorer and Advisor for months that your Explorer application was up and running. So some of you may just have the current or may have just a couple of previous monthly snapshots. And you see below that, we have scenario vintages. Once you start creating scenarios in planner of your boundary planning scenarios, those will become available inside of planner as well. So right now, if I were to just change it to a, let's go to the 11, 12 school year, you can see we can just change there. But maybe we were interested in looking again at a more longitudinal view or multi-year view. You'll notice that up in the series, and this is true of the group, 
we have an option to be able to choose vintages and years, which brings us to a dialog allowing us to select multiple vintages. So if I wanted to take a look at all of our last five annual school year snapshots, I could select those and click finish. And now you can see here, I'm just getting a, I have no variable selected, so I'm just getting a total student count by year of those vintages. Again, maybe I'm more interested in looking at what's our transferring looking like for those five years. And so we can then take a look at grouping them by the different, in this case, I'm using transfer status and looking at what it looks like from a transfer status perspective for each of those vintages. And as I mentioned, once we get into multi-year vintage analysis, we have some different output options. We still have our student count and our group share percentage, which we could change to. But we now have a change from a previous vintage. So we can take a look at trends going back in time, looking at our historical vintages. And we can see in this case, this is doing the number of students changed from the previous vintage. You'll notice the school year 11 and 12 dropped because there is no previous vintage to analyze it against. So we're just looking at what the change is to the previous vintage for each year. We can also do percent change from the previous vintage. You can also, and we'll take a look at this again, you can take a look at any of your attributes can be grouped. You can also swap the series and group. So the group again will control these headers and which you're, what you're gonna group your vintages by. And if we swapped them, it would be the other way. So maybe we wanna take a look at it by school year. Here's our elementary, middle, high, breakdowns, et cetera. So the swap button can be clicked to quickly swap the series and group axes. I'm gonna go back to our current vintage. Again, we could take a look at, we can group, we can use two variables. So here we're grouping by school type, but we're looking at the breakdowns by free and reduced. And again, we could swap that to get a different view if we wanted to look at it a little bit differently. Also, the data tables are always available with this data table button. Click that and your table of the data that makes up the chart will show up in the bottom half of the screen. And it's a toggle, you can just click it to hide that as well. And to go along with the data table, you'll notice we also have the ability to export the results. Now there is also an option, there should be options in yours to export the graphics, not just the Excel or CSV format of the data but there should be an option to output graphics to a PNG format, which is a portable network graphic format. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and go back to choosing multiple school year vintages. And then I'm gonna switch document types. Well, I, before I move on to that, I should, I should point out we do have the optional filters. So if you're not wanting to just look at the entire data stream, but again, wanting to filter on a subset, you still have the ability, just like in Explorer, to come into your, maybe you're just wanting to look at those that are eligible for free or reduced lunch, and you can go ahead and create that chart. That configure attribute filters button will have a red highlight, signifying that we indeed have filters set. So you're able to filter there. You're also able to spatially filter. So this is where the power really becomes evident in Advisor over something like Excel or some other product that's used to create bar charts is that is very difficult to do in spatial filter in other products. We click on the edit spatial filters button. You're gonna notice we're pushed over into a very similar and familiar map interface. 
Now it's giving us a note that says, edit geometry constraints using the map tools above and click this button to finish. So if we go over here to our drawing tools, we now can spatially filter using any of our drawing tools, including our advanced tool options if we wanted to do that. Once we have our area that we defined that we wanted to analyze, we click the finish editing spatial filters button. And now the bar chart is representing both spatial filters and attribute filters. At any time, if you want to, you can toggle those filters off or on. So it's gonna remember your spatial selection back there, but if you just wanna quickly compare that to full, maybe you're looking at group share percentages of something, and you wanna see if that percentage holds true with your geographic selection, as well as your full student selection, you can just toggle that on back and forth. I'm gonna go ahead and go into the spatial filters, get everybody back. And now we're gonna move on to seeing what happens when we switch document types. Now document types all have slightly different properties, but some properties carry forward from one to the next. So if we're if we have properties up in our bar chart that also could be represented as a line chart, for example, we could just toggle back and forth between document types. So if I click the line chart button at the top in the analysis section, you'll notice now that I still have my school year vintages being shown on the uh, x-axis here. And it's being done by school type. So it remembered the group and series settings that I had. Again, if they are able to be translated between document types, they will stay. We have, again, with our line option, we have output options for the either the full count, or again, we can do series share percentages. There still is the data table available in line charts, as well as the attribute and spatial filters. You'll notice now though, there is just a series option. I do have our vintages selected, so there's multiple vintages in the vintage chooser, but now I can just simply take a look at my different attributes. And moving on to pie charts, again, pie charts are very simple, so it's going to drop the all vintages, since pie charts aren't gonna be good at representing multiple years. Now it, it held the ethnicity field that I was looking at in the line chart, but it brought us to our current vintage. If we wanted to look at a different vintage, we could select that from the drop down and choose our vintage. And again, in the pie chart, we have the same option to do group share percentage or student count. You will notice that in, you actually can do multiple years if you just wanted to simply do a pie chart of total enrollment counts. I could select multiple vintages and it's just gonna give us our student counts for each of those years. By clicking on a piece of the pie, you can move it out slightly for your representation. And the last document type that we wanna take a look at would be thematic maps. What are thematic maps? When might you wanna use them? Thematic maps are meant to sort of, be, sort of be heat maps in a way. What we do is we take polygon layers that you have and allow those polygon layers to be represented in a color scale to show you something from the least concentrated areas to the most concentrated areas. And what it does is it aggregates or counts the number of students within a particular zone. In this case, we're looking at elementary schools and it's aggregating those students within those zones and creating a heat map or coloring that zone based on the number within there. So we can see 
we have a legend on the bottom left hand side telling us giving us kind of a rough breakdown from a minimum of 768 students in the very light blue to a maximum of 3,370 students in the dark, dark blue polygon. Again, right now, it's simply taking, it held our 11 and 12 school year vintage. We could move it to the current and switch our vintages. But there's one very important thing that we need to discuss about how this regions area is being determined. There's two options with our polygon layers. So right now, again, you'll notice that our default is to use elementary schools and they are res their residential geographies mapped by the home address. What that means is it's going to take all of the students who literally have been geocoded within that attendance area and it's going to aggregate them into that count and color the polygon by that count. The second option is to do it where it is mapped by school enrollment. So what that means is it doesn't matter where the student lives or is geocoded to, and I'll go ahead and switch this and show you the difference. So let me, let me go back and start over here with this Forest Hills Elementary. You can see here there are 2,812 students, and in this option, we're mapping by home address. So there are literally 2,812 students inside of that attendance area. If I were to map it by the school of enrollment, we're now gonna see that there's 1,281 students who are attending that school, but they don't necessarily res reside inside of it. So even if they're transferring in, they're still now part of this analysis. We're simply color coding that attendance area based on the students that are enrolled in that school, not just living in that attendance area. Hopefully that makes sense. You kind of got to play with things a little bit to really understand that and grasp that and understand where you might want to use the one analysis versus the other. Um, and for thematic maps to really be powerful, again, we're not just going to be usually doing total student counts, but we want to filter on some attribute. So maybe we're interested in our free and reduced map. What are our hotspots of our free and reduced lunch students? We would then go into our optional filters and go into our attributes filters, and we can select the variables we're looking for. So in this case, we want to see a heat map or a thematic map of eligible students for reduced or for free lunch. I'll click finish, and I'm going to go ahead and with the overlays, you have the ability to turn those points on and off if you want to, as well as the outlines if you wanted to. Another option, so now what we see here is we can, we can definitely see the higher concentration, the highest concentration of free and reduced lunch students is down in Russell Elementary School. Now, I'm doing this by school of enrollment. Does it change if I do it by where they actually live? And we can see the number is going to change, but basically it's still the highest concentration. You, did, you can see a lot of the others went up in color and got darker. So again, play with that. Try and understand how those two different geography options work for the different analysis you may want to do. We also have some output options. So again, right now we can see we are looking at elementary schools by home address and our subtitle shows us our filters. We're filtering by free and reduced, eligible for reduced, eligible for free. And in our output, we are seeing the total, or the, the total student count. We also have the option to do a count divided by total count. So we can get a percentage And there is an unfiltered, so this first option is the filtered count divided by total count. The unfiltered is going to give us that percent where it's going to be dividing by the unfiltered count. So that and this gets a little complicated. 
Um, this does get a little complicated <laughs> and complex, but um, trust us on this is you don't need to uh, out of the shoot. Um, you don't need to understand all of those components to really start to make advisor your friend. But once you get into that level of detail, we can definitely help you. But um, playing with advisor uh, and really kind of getting familiar with it is really um, important to, to start to see the power of what's in it. Because, yeah, as Dan is showing, there's a lot of different ways to slice and dice. Um, and it's it can get pretty granular if you want, or you can stay pretty big picture. Right. And, and thematic maps will be the newest to, to many of you and will probably, again, be the most complex or confusing at first until you've played with for, played with it for a while. My, my so belief is that once you start to create some of these thematic maps, you're going to be wanting to do that periodically, monthly or whatever, to take a look at change that might be happening in your student population and using these for reports. And then you'll start to really understand um, those thematic maps more. And one of the things to... about Advisor is it's really been created, as you can see, as a very robust standalone module that can do charting, graphing, mapping in a lot of different unique ways. What's also really cool about Advisor is it allows uh, reports to become visualized out of planner. So for those of you that have done school boundary plans um, with our old module, you know that they were PDFs. Um, now they can be visualized in Advisor because the two modules work together and are smart um, and, and you can compare scenarios that are created in Planner in Advisor. So it really is a powerful tool um, for reporting on its own, but it's also very powerful of how it's connected to Planner. So if you're doing a school boundary change, you can really quickly visualize your reports and get really inf uh, interesting information. I didn't mean to jump ahead, Dan, but are you ready to jump over to Planner? As That's okay. I was just I was taking a look at a question that was just coming in about uh, multi vintages with thematic maps. And again, that is a um, w what you can do. Multi years on a thematic map is not something that it, we've we've created an analysis for at this time. Again, that would be a complex um, map that would have to take place. But I think where you're probably going with that is wanting to know what's what's my change looking like year over year and that's something that will be an enhancement to the thematic maps for now what you can do is again you can change your your uh your vintage and to take a look at the different years so you can do it manually right now again i envision in the future where there will be that a, a deeper analysis that will say hey there was this percent change from this vintage to that vintage and it would color polygons based on those uh, interactions. But again, that's not there in version one here of Advisor today. You would have to do what I did where you're choosing separate vintages to take a look at that uh, individually and outputting those graphics individually. The last couple of options I wanna point out before I move on to Planner, I'm wanting to be cognizant of your time. We wanna make sure we spend the last 25 minutes here um, going over uh, Planner, changes in Planner and showing you that since we're very excited about what we've added to Planner. But the last thing here is you can, for those statistical data gurus who understand scales or algorithms, squares, square root, logarithmic analysis, you can choose different options here and your scale will update. By default, we recommend you leave it at equal interval, which will simply create equal breakdowns in this scale down at the bottom. The other option is to label just the value or the geography's name and its value. So those are the last options that I wanted to point out there. Again, we can output the graphics to PNG and the map legend to a PNG, as well as the results in Excel and CSV format. We can also share and save a link to send to somebody else in, in the district, your district that may have uh, rights to advisor and the data you're looking at. If you wanted to share a document that you created. You can choose the save a link option, copy this to your clipboard and email it to somebody. And if they've got permissions and are logged into Guide K-12, 
it'll come back up right where you created that save link from. All right, so that's uh, advisor in a nutshell. Let's move on over to planner. We'll also be pulling advisor in to help us with planner as well to show you the interaction there. So going into planner, which replaces enrollment view, you'll notice that one major change um, right off the bat is you're not presented with a scenario builder dialog box anymore. Previously in enrollment view, we forced you to go in and either open or create a scenario. You literally now can go into planner and use it as explorer minus a, minus a couple of functionality. You may remember from enrollment view, we can't click on student dots to learn their individual identities anymore to make sure that when you're planning, some of that anonymity is there and unbiased um, logic goes into it. So you can't click and get the individuals in, in here, but what you can do is in a pre-filtered manner, meaning it's pre-filtered to the level that you have selected in your dropdown in the top right. So right now we are pre-filtered on elementary students. You're able to go in and use Explore on the current vintage prior to even creating your scenario. So that's one major change I just wanted to point out um, which works different from enrollment view. But everything else you'll notice, the map and for, for the most part, the left-hand dashboard has a similar look and feel. Once we open a scenario or create a scenario, there will be some changes in addition on the left-hand side that uh, you'll like as well, and we'll show you those in a moment. We, you'll notice in Planner, we also have the changes dialog above the filter section now. So that's another difference from Explorer to Planner. We now are going to be creating scenarios where essentially we're taking copies of a base vintage of student data and boundaries and allowing you to play with the boundaries and student assignments and make scenarios. At the top here of our menu, left to the left of the planner icon when you're in there, are our scenario options. You'll see we have a number of options. The first couple deal with creating or opening existing scenarios or copying a scenario that you're in. We have added a lot of cues to things such as if I weren't went to uh, copy this scenario and I wasn't in a scenario, it's going to make sure it tells us that we need to open or create a scenario first. So we've got a lot of visual cues now that lets you know when things are successful or not as you're making changes in your scenarios. I'm going to go ahead and create a scenario. To create a scenario, we just need to give it a title. Choose our base vintage if you had multiple vintages available. Again, the default should be your most current vintage available to you. Otherwise, you can choose from the dropdown which you want to use. We click Create. And we now have a scenario to work with. Okay, so now we've got our scenario set. We're in the elementary level. One thing you'll notice I mentioned on the left-hand panel is some additions that we made. We've added a capacity summary. So if you have if you have provided us with capacities for your buildings, you will now have a dynamic view of how many students over or under each building is, as well as the percent of that capacity. So we can see here we have a breakdown here, and this will dynamically change as we make updates. It is collapsible and expandable. You can also see we also have a racial balance count as well by school, giving you the count of students of color and the percent. So again, those are two additions to the summary panel that again will update as you make changes. All of the functionality in uh, Enrollment View has ported forward, such as the way you go about creating your scenarios, creating new areas to move from one school to another. That's all stayed the same. Let's take a look at an example. Let's say that I wanted to remove Norris Elementary and, and divvy up a couple of areas. We can come in here with our drawing tools 
Again, if you had other layers, such as neighborhood layers, they would be available in your advanced tools and you could actually select those polygons. But in this case, I don't. So I'm just gonna go and draw ad hoc polygons. And yeah, once we get our area. do I have to be when I'm drawing? How specific do I have to be? Is it um, going to know which boundaries or do I need to be um, fine tuned? Yeah. When I'm drawing? So I, as, as usual, as we suggest, you know, it's always a good idea when you're doing this. And again, I'm being uh, a lot less granular than, than you should be, but you should have your parcels turned on. Um, make sure you're zoomed in so that you're following the features that you need to follow. And as a good practice, you know, it's always good when you're drawing your new areas to move from one school to another. You wanna make sure that if, say I'm moving this Norris Elementary into Calderon Elementary, which I'm going to do, you wanna make sure that that new area you draw goes into the Calderon Elementary area. That way it won't leave slivers or gaps. So when it merges those two shapes together, we'll have a much cleaner attendance area. It's not crucial again, as long as you're selecting the students that you want to select to move, you can do it any way you want to. But I do recommend drawing down to a very granular level and making sure you're as precise as you can be when drawing your new areas. So I've drawn this area, which I want to move to Calderon Elementary. Again, you would have access to be able to choose whether you want to grandfather certain grades into this move or um, transfer students if you wanted to say we're not going to move these kids that are transferring within the district um, we could just say give us just the home area enrolled students for example now we're only going to be changing student assignments for those students who are home area enrolled students i'm going to go ahead and now that i'm ready to make a change i'm going to click the change dialog button we have some options now. This has slightly changed a little bit in that there's still four options, but one of the options is different. And one of the options it used to have is missing. And that is the zones is new. We have allowed for different zone type changes so that if you're a customer who is managing walk areas in particular, this is where this functionality uh, came from. Some of our customers have walk zones that they might want to do scenarios for you can actually make changes to other zones using the scenarios as well. So in this case, we're not going to use that here because we don't have other zones, but we're going to be using the standard student assignments and zone options. We could just change the student assignments or we could send them home. So those options still exist. If we just change student assignments, the one you'll notice is missing is moving students to a non-level school. You no longer have to choose that option. You would just choose the student assignment only option. And it will then allow you to select from the full list of district-wide schools to be able to assign them to and move them to the proper level. I will leave it at the default. We're gonna move these to Calderon. And just in the sake of time, I'm just gonna, we would give it a nice summary, de summary description of what we're moving. Uh, and then we give it a more, detailed description if we wanted to and we would click the make change it's going to let us know that we were successful we can click that to dismiss it we're going to see that now that area that i drawn is now moved into calderon elementary and notice there's a little label down here for norris i must have left the sliver down there so that's where it's important to make sure to draw into that next area if a little sliver gets created you may get a label that gets stuck somewhere so now we've seen that. Now I'm going to use the um, our advanced tools to select the remainder of Norris that I want to move to another school, which is going to be Edgewood Elementary. I can make that change. I can choose Edgewood. Now I've removed or moved that area to Edgewood. And now let's take a look 
at some differences here. One we can do is we can say open this scenario in advisor. If we want to envision you have two monitors, you could have advisor up on one monitor and um, planner in the other, and you'd be able to have a dynamic charting um, capability to take a look at your scenario. In hey Dan, before yeah. you jump into that, can you jump back to planner and show me where I find my changes? It used to show me where all the logic was. Where do I see the steps of the changes in the logic now in planner? Yeah, I, I can certainly jump to that. Uh, that is up here under the changes dialog. You'll notice we have undo and redo change buttons. Again, these undo and redo will undo and redo your changes. There are undo and redo on the map. Don't get confused. The map ones will undo the map drawings, but it will not undo the actual changes. So keep those undo redo buttons separate. And then the changes, um, we have an edit and view change history dialog. Again, this is replacing the console that used to be at the bottom of your map. Now you'll get a change history dialog that you can view where you can undo and redo changes. And what we were going to do here is I was going to do one more change after I got advisor up and we were going to take a look at how you can undo changes um, without having to, you can undo changes from the beginning and not have to affect some of the most recent changes in case you want to get something further back. Previously in enrollment view, if you got something, got rid of for something five steps ago, it's going to get rid of everything else as well. But we've made that an enhancement that's much better. So I was going to go ahead here and notice that in visor, envision again that this is up on a different monitor. You'll notice now that it, by default, when I said open this scenario in planner or in advisor, it is comparing the vintage I just created the scenario there to the base vintage that we started with. So we can see the difference right here in the bar chart uh, for Calderon Elementary. And you know, we could filter that down if we only wanted to look at the schools that we affected. Calderon, Edgewood, and Norris. And we can take a look at those comparisons and see what's happened. So it looks like we still have some transfer students that are still assigned to Norris, but this will detect changes. So let's go ahead over here and let's get those students from Norris who are transferring. And because they have a geographic tie, let's just grab these guys and say we're going to move them to Calderon. And then we'll take a look at how we can undo some change history here. So in this case, we're just going to do student assignments to Calderon. Again, you would give it a summary. I'm going to, for the sake of time, just move on. Okay, so now we've moved those students, we have additional change history, but more importantly, advisor has noticed and detected that we made a change. So back in my advisor screen, I see that it has been refreshed due to a scenario change. So it, every couple seconds it's checking for changes in planner, as long as a scenario vintage is up, it's gonna check planner to see if it's made any changes and it's gonna automatically update that chart. So this really replaces that your indicators console at the bottom of enrollment view, which basically just had two indicators, your capacity and your um, free and reduced or economically disadvantaged indicator. Now you're able to obviously use any of these attributes to quickly see what the makeup change has been from scenario to scenario or from scenario to your base vintage or if you wanted to choose multiple scenarios, you can see you can choose from your other scenarios. Maybe you have options A, B, and C, and you want to compare them to the current state. You could have four different vintages up there 
three scenarios and one base vintage, and you could create a graphic that would show you the differences between each. Okay, now showing you a nonlinear change. Say I didn't want to do that first change I made. It's a two step process to do a nonlinear change, but it's pretty easy and pretty straightforward once you have done this a few times. I can say reset to before this change, so I'm gonna get rid of this first one. It's gonna go ahead and undo all of it. So it's gonna actually undo the all three. But what it does allow me to do is to come back in and say, okay, now that I've undone everything there, I wanna go from step two and keep step two and three. So I can redo this and all following changes. When I come and click that, you're going to see that my steps two and three have been maintained. And this is telling me here that by the highlight in the top, I've undone that first change and I redid the other two, and they're still there to undo as well if we wanted to do that again. Dan, who has access to the scenarios that I create? Good question. So now in Planner, your scenarios are associated to your user login until you choose to share that scenario. So we have some options inside of our vintage information when we're in a scenario. Once we want to share that scenario or if we want to share it with others, we would open up the vintage information and there's a checkbox that says share this scenario read only with other planner users. Checking that box will make this available to other planner users with proper credentials in your district to see that scenario in a read-only fashion, but they can make a copy of it and then take off from there. So say somebody wanted to make a copy uh, of where you had gotten to with your progress, they can make a copy of the read-only scenario not affecting yours at all, and then they can branch off from there and have their own scenario. Right. Should we open up for questions, um, or are, are there a couple yeah. more um, features that we need to uh, to go through? Just two, um, just two minutes that I can go through and and talk about the exports. We now can again. We have a much better output on the map image. It's going to give you exactly what you see on the map image in a higher resolution output PNG format. Um, you still can output your boundaries as a shape file as well as the student data table and assignments. The reports are all redone. They are all exclusively in Excel format and have been reformatted. We'll just take a look at a one of the more useful reports is the impact report. To show you how we've redone all of all of the uh, reports in useful Excel format with formatting And I'm just going to switch screens here. And now you should all be seeing the export of the impact report again, which across the top by default. Now this one's going to have tabs on the bottom for each level, whether they were affected or not. All exports reports contain all levels now, which is kind of nice. Um, but more importantly, the impact report now shows you all schools for a level, as we can see here as I scroll across all of them, or if we want to find that needle in a haystack again, or what specifically has been affected, which schools, and what are the impacts, there's a tab for impacted schools. And you can see the breakdowns are very granular to all of the, uh, right from the target capacities of the full capacity of the school to grade level breakdowns, as well as your important planning variables, here we've got transfer status, ethnicity, ELL, home language, special ed, free and reduced. With all of your changes with now and percents as well, counts and percents with the changes for you. So basically that's that's uh, it in a nutshell because we're running out of time. And as Julie mentioned, I think we want to open it up to questions that anybody may have at the end here. Um, and certainly we're always available. One thing I will point out prior to Turning it over also is that uh, we have a new help site. Uh, 
And it looks like I'm back now. I don't know how long I was muted for, but it told me I was muted there. Sorry about that, everybody. Uh, we have a new help site at help.guidek12.com where each product has its own individual page. And feel free to go ahead and look at those. Again, a lot of um, useful uh, help articles specific to each product. With that, Julie, I'll turn it over to you to go ahead with questions. Thanks, Dan. That was a lot of information in a, in a fairly rapid fire, but hopefully what you got were some of the fundamentals, and as you start to play with it, the tool is um, pretty intuitive, pretty easy to use, so we hope that by playing with it and asking questions that you'll quickly feel comfortable and up to speed and be introducing it to other users within the district with this expanded capability. Um, with that, we've opened up the, the um, phone lines. And so if anybody's got any questions in the last couple minutes here, or if you want to type them in the chat window, or we can uh, wrap it up a couple minutes early. Any questions that we can answer? Hi, this is Richard. I have a question. Yes. Uh, if we can go back to the planner, when you created uh, a couple of polygons in the menu on the left, it identified the total number of students for each one of the polygons that created. But although you have a, um, a number of polygons created, I'd like to be able to see the information in one of the polygon and then go to the next one and see so I can make some sort of comparison. Is that possible? Uh, no, you know, it's, it, it will allow you to draw multiple polygons. What you'll notice is I drew one polygon and made a change at a time. In theory, you can draw multiple polygons if you're going to assign them to the same school and make that change simultaneously. But no, there's, there's currently not something that's going to. So what you're looking for is if I had an area drawn here and here, you'd want something on the left-hand side to say uh, graphic one has this breakdown, graphic two has this breakdown. Is that what that, I'm understanding? Yes, yes. Well, another okay. way to do that, though, is is you could, um, if it was, if you were comparing schools or zones and it wasn't yes. polygons, if you would click in, say, the pink area, it would give you the comparison. And then you just drag that purple dot to the next one. Okay. And, and then it's not additive. Yeah. It would give you a comparison of that next one. It doesn't, um, you know, continue to show the first one, but you could get a sense of if I was in the purple one and then I dragged it up to the yellow, you would definitely get just those selected areas. So it would okay. give you a little bit of what you're talking about, um, especially if you're just comparing buildings, that's really easy. Okay, all right, very good, thank you. Yeah, so you can kind of get around it, Richard, but I do like your idea and that is some other people have brought that up as well. And so that's certainly something that can go into our future uh, enhancement ideas would be to uh, be able to to delineate those numbers by uh, graphic or selection area. All right. Well, I want to just say thank you for everybody for your attendance. Thank you for being uh, Guy Cake 12 customers. And again, we're here to help and we're excited about all of the new uh, applications and the things that you can do with the enhanced functionality. So again, Dan, I want to say thank you for uh, leading us through that and a great job. And thank, thank you everybody for your time and uh, let us know how we can help. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.